Hello, Bobby. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on the E2 Investor Visa. Uh, topic today is focused on folks that might be facing layoff potentially or already have faced layoff and seeing the options for remaining in the United States. My name is Bobby Chung. I'm an immigration attorney, and my law practice focuses on helping foreign entrepreneurs obtain the E2 investor visa in order to live and work in the United States and operate their business. I'm here with my colleague and friend, Daniel Piram. Daniel is a franchise Hello. consultant focusing on helping foreign citizen entrepreneurs um, buy ideal franchise businesses to qualify for the E2 investor visa. I'm going to begin the presentation with the uh, the visa law aspect of our webinar, and then we'll transition to Daniel, who will show you how to select and identify the most ideal businesses for E2 investment, especially for folks that are in a time crunch with a time limitation. So here we go. I'm going to turn off my video and audio. Uh, just like to encourage everyone to use the chat area to ask questions. OK, we're going to try to cover them at the end. Thank you. Definitely. Um, we're going to have a Q&A portion at the very end. So if you think of any question, you're most welcome to uh, send us your questions throughout. And I'll, me and Daniel will answer them towards the very end. All right. So we're going to hit three main topics today. Number one is. Uh, for folks that are holding employment visas like H-1B, L-1, J-1, TN visas, for example, and are facing layoff or potential layoff, have been laid off, um, what to do, what you need to pay attention to, to maintain status, to stay lawful in the United States. And number two is, um, how do you prolong that? Is there a way to extend your status in the United States to figure out what to do? You know, a lot of folks, uh, who are working here on a working visa have a, a pretty good life here. You have a home, you have kids going to school, and suddenly you have this economic downturn and you face a layoff, but you don't want to just give up on life here. You can't just abruptly leave the United States. What are the ways of staying here longer to figure out what your options are? And lastly, I want to present to you the option of uh, continuing your stay in the United States through an entrepreneurial visa. By being your own, own boss, creating your own business, and qualifying for the E2 investor visa. Well, the great thing about the E2 investor visa is you're, you don't have to depend on anybody else to sponsor you. You sponsor yourself, and you have the independence and control over your destiny here in the United States. Uh, you're no longer at the mercy of an employer who may or may not pull the rug from under your feet suddenly. All right, well, let's begin. So the first thing, uh, we want to talk about is for employment visa holders, wh what you should know after layoff. Okay, for most employment visas, there are typically a 60 day grace period provided for under law for the uh, work visa categories of H 1B, L 1, O 1, TN, and even the E 1, 2, and 3 employee categories. So if you hold working visa in these uh, non immigrant visa employment visas, you could have up to 60 days of grace period to stay in the United States. Now, what can you do during this 60 day grace period? You're not allowed to work. Um, however, the, the grace period is intended to give you an opportunity to look for uh, new opportunities to stay in the United States. Some people are able to secure new employment, have the new employer sponsor them for employment visa. Some people want to go to school and switch to a student visa. Some people decide to be entrepreneurs and start looking at investing, starting a business, doing conducting the research and due diligence to figure that out. That's the purpose of that 60 day grace period. OK, now the 60 day grace period is also controlled by the validity time left on your I-94 arrival record, your authorized stay here. So if the remaining time on your I-94 record is shorter than 60 days, then the grace period will be corresponded, correspondingly reduced by the amount of time remaining on your I-94 permission to stay. Okay, so the 60 day is the maximum period so long as your I-94 is still valid for more than 60 days. Now, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the 60 days, you're not allowed to engage in employment activity, cannot work, okay? 
Um, however, you can engage in business investment, a uh, business setup. That's not considered working. That's considered investment activity. And that is allowed. Okay. Now, is there a way to prolong your employment visa status uh, before relying on the grace period? Yes, that's a possibility. If you have any accrued paid vacation time, you can utilize that now and uh, go on paid vacation time where you are technically still an employee of the company, albeit you are on paid vacation time or paid absence. So that could delay the official employment termination. The key is the, the employment visa status uh, terminates upon official employment termination, not before, not after, upon the last day of employment. And then if you're eligible for the grace period, the grace period will begin from the date of employment termination, the last day of employment. So it's possible to prolong the uh, termination date by using pay vacation time to extend your, your uh, employment status with the company. For folks who are here on F1 student visa, the so-called optional practical training, if there's a layoff situation, um, you, the OPT, what we call optional practical training, actually allows you to engage in self-employment, so long as the self-employment is in the area of your academic study. So you can go on self-employment, for example, and prolong, uh, be able to utilize the remainder of your OPT validity period, OPT status. And then after the OPT status expires, you have up to 60 days of grace period, similar to what the employment visa folks, to get ready to depart the United States or look for other opportunities to extend your stay, stay here, such as looking for an employer sponsor or uh, looking at entrepreneurship investment as an option, okay? Now, let's say um, the, the F1 OPT student on optional practical training gets laid off and um, um, because of the academic field that uh, you have studied, um, you're not able to start up a business in that particular field. Um, in that scenario, what you can do potentially to extend, to continue the validity of the optional practical training is to do volunteer work. Optional practical training doesn't require the person to be in a paid employment. Volunteer unpaid work activity, even part-time, could satisfy, satisfy OPT and keep it valid until its expiration date. So this is what you need to be aware if you are facing layoff, uh, been laid off, or potentially expect a layoff. Think about these things in advance, okay? Now, the next thing you want to think about is, well, how do I continue to stay here, prolong my stay? Because the 60-day grace period may be completely inadequate to come up with a new solution. A very popular option it, that we've been using to help our clients is to apply a change of status to a, a B1 business visitor or B2 visitor for pleasure. And that allows you to extend your stay for up to six additional months. And um, these two different options allow very specific activities. Okay, so if your intention is to consider uh, the option of entrepreneurship, starting your own business, making an investment, then you need to specifically apply for a change of status for B1 business investor. This is very important because B1 business investor, B1 business visitor is the category that would allow you to engage in business activities like making an investment, setting up a business, buying a business, conducting due diligence, doing market research. Okay. And you have to demonstrate to immigration that's your legitimate and credible intention. Show them that you have the financial ability, show them that you've taken steps towards um, that business setup or business investment in order to be believable and credible. And uh, upon approval, you can get six months of additional stay in the United States for you to complete that business objective and then, then be able to transition from that point to an E2 investor visa, for example, to continue your, your stay in the United States. Um, another option for folks is to change to a B, B2 pleasure visitor um, that will allow you to stay here for up to six months and, uh, and it'll allow you to just engage in leisurely activities, okay? Vacationing, pleasure, leisure, traveling around. It would not authorize you to do uh, business activities or business investments. So this is a very important distinction. If you want to 
have the option of making a business investment, you got to make sure that, um, specifically ask immigration for B1 business visitor status. You don't want to get a B an extension for six months that on a B2 and then discover that oh my you're not allowed to engage in any business activities. Uh, that would be a um, you know a horrible opportunity a opportunity wasted and and you want to avoid that. Okay. Um, now applying for B1 business visitor change of status application requires a good amount of supporting evidence to show immigration that you're a credible uh, investor and that you are sincere and genuine serious about doing this. They're, they're not just going to believe anybody. Okay, so it's very important that you allow sufficient time to prepare this B1 business visitor application. It's important to prepare a strong application to maximize your chances of approval. And typically I recommend folks to start prep preparing at least, ideally, at least two months uh, of time to be able to prepare for this. Um, to gather up the money, to show that you have the money, to show your business plan. And if you've begun the business setup process, like registering a company, opening a business account, getting a tax ID, or starting the negotiations with seller or franchisor or landlord, showing the draft contract, those are the type of evidence that needs to be submitted together with a B1 application to demonstrate you're a credible entrepreneur. Immigration, they're a skeptical bunch of people. They're not just simply going to take your word for it in most cases. So important that you have enough time, ideally at least two months time to prepare, but at the maximum minimum one month time to prepare. And that might be a little bit stressful because uh, of the limitation in time. Okay. Now I'm going to touch upon the main purpose of this presentation, which is the option of being an entrepreneur qualifying for E2 investor visa and being allowed to sponsor yourself to stay in the United States uh, without depending on any employer or anybody else. Um, so what is this E2 investor visa? It's a temporary visa designed for entrepreneurs, business people to live and work in the United States by buying a business or starting a business, okay? This visa allows a spouse and unmarried minor children of the investor to stay in the United States with the investor entrepreneur. The spouse is eligible to get a working permit to work anywhere, any job, help out in the business, or start his or her own separate business. A lot of freedom for the spouse. So what some of my clients would do is they would have the, uh, the spouse that um, it doesn't really need uh, employment opportunity, is not looking for employment opportunity to apply as the investor. And then the spouse that has a strong resume with the greatest potential of um, professional employment opportunity would apply as the E2 dependent spouse, thereby qualifying for the spousal working permit. And when the economy gets better, improves, opportunity uh, comes your way, um, the E2 spouse then will be able to take advantage of those employment opportunity because of E2 spousal working permit. On the other hand, the E2 investor, the main applicant, is limited to focusing on running the E2 business only. So this is some, a strategy planning that I do with clients to figure out who would be the better person to apply as the E2 investor and who should be applying as the E2 spouse. And we look at who has a better job potential and uh, who has the right credentials to be the entrepreneur for E2 visa. Now kids, kids under 21, uh, American kids under 21 will be able to go to school, uh, attend public, free public school, just like American kids. So uh, it's, uh, you don't have to worry about any of that. Now, very important is that the E-2 visa is only available to citizens of so-called treaty countries. So out of about 200 countries in the world, only 82 countries have the requisite treaty with the United States that allow their citizens to apply for the E-2 visa. And I have a full list of the 82 countries on my website, on, as you see on your screen, uh, e2visalawyer.net, um, that you can check out and um, see the full list and make sure that you are a citizen of a qualifying country. Now, for folks that have multiple nationalities, all you got to have is one qualifying citizenship, and then you can apply for the E-2 investor visa. Okay. Now, the E-2 investor visa is just a temporary visa. You don't get U.S. citizenship. It's not green card or permanent residence. It's a temporary visa issue in two to five year increments, depending on what country you're, for, you're from. Um, the, the treaty between U.S. and the country, particular country, will specify the duration of the E-2 visa. But don't worry, even though it's a temporary visa, as long as you continue to own and run the business, this visa can be renewed forever. 
indefinitely in two to five year increment. Uh, I have clients who've been living here more than 20 years on the E2 visa. And the US government have no reason to shut you down because you're creating jobs and you're paying taxes, you're contributing to the economy, they love you. you know. So there's uh, no reason to worry about being shut down. As long as you're doing well enough and your business is able to support you and your tenants, you can renew it forever. Now, a lot of people ask me, will I ever be able to qualify for a green card? Yes, that's a possibility. Although the E2 visa by itself doesn't directly lead to a green card, as long as uh, you qualify for a green card category, you could pursue it while you're on an E2 visa. For example, if the E2 spouse gets a job with an American company and a company sponsor him or her for the employment green card, you can do that. Or you can, uh, if you, your investment is great enough, accumulates to a high enough level, you could potentially apply for the EB-5 investment green card, $900,000 investment green card. Okay, so this is an overview of the E-2 investor visa, entrepreneur visa. Some of the top question people ask me is how much do you have to invest? Now, the law doesn't say how much uh, give a minimum investment amount. Uh, it just says you have to make a substantial investment. I typically recommend an investment at least $100,000 for a good case. But if your investment budget is less than 100,000, talk to me, talk to Daniel. Uh, it may be possible for you to qualify with a lower amount. Uh, it, it doesn't category disqualify you. I've gotten approval with a little, as little as $35,000 investment. Now the, the truth be told, in smaller investment below 100,000 is more challenging to get approval. Immigration can be skeptical about the sufficiency of the amount, but it's not impossible. But ideally for a good case, we recommend 100,000 or above. Okay. The second favorite question is what kind of business should I buy to qualify? Now, Daniel, he's really put a lot of thought and research and has great knowledge on the appropriate businesses for E2 visa. And he'll go into that in much more detail. But just a general overview for E2 qualification, uh, immigration, they're pretty open-minded on what business can qualify, okay? Almost any business can qualify. Key criteria that immigration care about are number one, the, job, the business should create jobs for American workers, meaningful jobs, multiple American workers. Doesn't have to be a lot of employees. If you hire at least two or three employees, that could satisfy, satisfy immigration. Second, it should be a business with a physical permit, like an office or a shop or restaurant or store. It shouldn't be your home because those are typically seen as marginal businesses that are too small to qualify, okay? Thirdly, it should be an asset-based business. You know, you sh there should be things about the business that you could use your money on to show an investment, um, such as buying inventory, equipment, supplies, spending money on marketing or building out a store, those type of things. If you just have a bunch of cash sitting in the bank account, immigration, they're not gonna be happy because they consider that's not committed money. Okay. And then lastly, the, the business ought to be able to make enough money to support you and your family. And it um, doesn't have to be a huge amount of money. It just be, needs to be reasonably enough to be able to support you and your family, depending on the cost of living in your area. Also very important, I want to share with you is uh, how do you get the money to qualify for E2 investment? This is a big question for a lot of people. Now on the screen, you'll see the top 10 uh, sources of investment money for most, most E2 investors, okay? So I just wanna share with you these areas, so just in case you're not aware, it's actually quite broad. Um, and uh, you can raise money through a variety of ways that could satisfy immigration for an E2 investment. And some of the most popular areas are such as just simply savings for employment income or business income. Some folks will get a personal loan from family or friends or, or a financial institution lenders such as a bank, okay? and Private loans are also acceptable, okay? Um, a lot of folks uh, own a house or property, and if you're able to use that as collateral security and secure a line of credit with your bank, or even remortgaging the real estate property, the interest rates are historically low right now. So this will be actually a great time if you have equity in your house to remortgage it, look into the remortgaging opportunities to refinance and pull out some equity and use that for the business investment. Okay, some folks get have um, you know wealthy family or even wealthy friends who are able to extend a gift, and that could be a qualifying source of investment money. 
Some people have real estate asset that they divest. You sell off and you can use your real estate uh, sales proceeds for the investment. Now, this is what some of my clients do. Sometimes selling real estate might take time. You know, you don't want to rush into it because you don't want to sell at a bad price. You want to get a good price for your property. So what some people do is they'll uh, secure a line of credit with the bank first on the property and pull out a line of credit and be, utilize that to make the business investment to apply for the E2 visa. And that way they're not in a huge time rush to sell the property and take their time to sell the property at the ideal price. And upon selling the property, they can pay back that line of credit or that remortgaging, for, for example. So that's a strategy some of my clients have done for uh, folks that have property in areas where uh, they're not able to sell the property fast enough, or right now the price isn't so good, so they don't want to rush into selling at a low price. Okay. Some of my clients have uh, investments in stocks, bonds, treasury notes, and other financial securities that they liquidate. They sell off and use the proceeds for the E2 investment. Some folks will draw money from retirement savings, retirement pension, benefits, annuities. Um, that could be a qualifying source of investment as well. And lastly, uh, sources such as getting an inheritance. Um, if you own business and you sell part of your business or your whole business, that could work. And some folks uh, receive settlements from divorce proceedings. So these are the top 10 areas of a funding source. And um, yeah, this is a complicated area. So this requires analysis and strategizing with the attorney. So uh, I just want to give you a high level understanding of the possibilities. Um, but the actual source will require some discussion and strategizing with the expert attorney. Okay. All right. So that concludes my part of the presentation. Like I said before, I'll be available to answer Q&A. If you've already posted some questions, I'll be happy to answer them towards the very end. And now I'm going to transition to my colleague and friend, Daniel. Hello, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you very much for a uh, great presentation. Covered a lot of ground. Uh, I'd like to share my slide deck with the audience here. Could you please let me know if you, you can see the screen right now? It may, may be a little delayed. Are you able to see my, my slide deck? Yes, looks great. All right. Thank you very much. So hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, your attendance today. It's a pleasure to be to be here joining forces with immigration attorney Bobby Chung uh, and help you guys create a solution for transitioning from a work visa into potentially an investor's visa. And uh, I'm also an immigrant. I was born and raised in Brazil. I have been living here for the past 10 years. I can only imagine uh, the stress of being laid out of a, of a job once you have moved to the United States, settled here with your family, kids are in school, all that great life, and suddenly you have to figure out, uh, you know, a, a way to continue that lifestyle in a legal manner. So uh, I'd like to focus my my conversation today, my presentation today, on uh, franchise opportunities that offer a fast time to market. Uh, my understanding here is that we have a time frame of about up to six months uh, using the strategies that, that Bobby um, presented a few minutes ago. And uh, franchising in the United States is highly regulated. So let's make the, the lawyers happy here. All that you're going to see here is for information of purpose only. Uh, the prospective investor will not be offered a franchise unless and until both prospective investor and the franchisor have complied with any ap applicable pre-sale registration and or disclosure requirements in the applicable jurisdiction in which the proposed franchise is to be operated. So this is for your information only. Uh, I'm going to cover very quickly to visa requirements. Bobby ha has, has done a great job there. Uh, talk a little bit about, about the franchise advantage, uh, especially when it comes to E2 visa application, how we franchise wizards can help you. Uh, talk a little bit about growth drivers and investment levels. So now I'm, I'm getting into franchise selection here and give you an idea of timeline for this whole process. Uh, I encourage you to ask questions uh, using the chat box. I have uh, posted a, a need to visa guide that you are able to download uh, if you click on the link on the right hand side. Uh, that is a booklet that was written by my uh, wife and business partner, 
Shayla and, and Attorney Chung. And it covers most uh, frequently asked questions about E2Visa. It's a great resource for you. I don't want to spend a lot of time here on the E2Visa requirements. I uh, just want to add something about that $100,000 threshold. Uh, it's not mandatory. What happens is that most uh, executive business models, they start around $100,000. What is an executive business model? Is first is the ideal vehicle is, is ideal investment vehicle for the E2. You, the investor, you retain administrative functions, very often sales functions, but you hire the employees that are going to do the core business, produce the product that you're offering, or perform the service that you are offering. Another thing that I'd like to to add to the, the explanation Bobby gave you uh, is that it has to be a real business operation. Nothing that has a strong speculative nature uh, will qualify you for the E2 visa. So I've heard so many times people who want to buy uh, damaged vehicles in auction and they want to, to refurbish and resell, that has a strong speculative nature, uh, especially on the supply side, not very good vehicle. Uh, the franchise advantage in general and under the eyes of the E2 visa investor. So franchise, franchises will, out, um, uh, will provide you a, a roadmap for implementing your business and for ramping that business up. You know the initial and operating costs uh, with a, a great level of accuracy because those costs are documented on uh, a, a standard document, document that has to be offered by the franchisors for your review. It's called the Franchise Disclosure Document. That's a lengthy document. It's a standardized document. So if you're talking to two, three, four franchisors, uh, the information is always presented to you in the same sequence, which makes comparing opportunities much easier. So uh, that document will be part of your E2Visa application. That will make the life of the immigration officer reviewing your case a lot easier as well, because he or she can refer to that document for the, the benchmarks uh, of that particular industry. Whenever you are part of a, um, a, a franchise system, you can tap on these economies of scale provided by the franchisor. So franchisor, chances are they buy products and services much cheaper than you would do if you were to operate a similar business completely independent. Uh, and they flow down those economies of scale for the franchisees protecting your bottom line. For me, maybe one of the best values in, in, in any franchise system is to be able to tap on established marketing programs. You don't have to do your trial and error. Somebody else has done the trial and error for you. You just need to execute a program that has been developed and perfected by the franchisor. Uh, you receive initial training and continued support. You don't need to, be, to come from a particular industry in order to operate a franchise business. It's, it's uh, packaged in, su in such a way that uh, any industry that you come from, your, your, your professional background, uh, can be uh, adapted to, to execute that particular type of business. Uh, I would just create a parenthesis here for, uh, for the food industry. Food industry, yes, it, it, it is an advantage for you if you have experience uh, coming from that, that industry, but any other industry, uh, most of the cases, that's not, you don't need to have that sort of experience. So at the end of the day, having access uh, to real data provided by the franchisor documented in the franchise disclosure document allows you to create a credible business plan. Uh, I can't stress enough how important it is to create a business plan that is credible. You don't need to show the immigration officer that you want to be rich in that business plan. You need to, to show the immigration officer that all the parameters that you elected and are projecting in that business plan are within the benchmarks for the particular industry.
how we can help you at Franchise Wizards. We do something called franchise match matchmaking. From all the business opportunities out there, franchised or independent, uh, resale of existing operations or initiating your own new franchise operation. Um, there is a subset of businesses that are eligible for the E2 visa. And Bobby mentioned, you know, being able to uh, create jobs, have a physical address, uh, asset-based businesses, and uh, businesses that are, are, of course, profitable enough to create uh, the, the, the right support for your family here in the United States. Uh, so as active business models, they, they fit very well into that description. Uh, within those businesses, there is a subset of E2 visa friendly franchise. And there is a difference between a uh, business model that is E2 visa compliant and a E2 visa friendly franchisor who welcomes working with international investors. So we have identified those for you. We confront that with what we call your ideal business profile. I already know they have to be E2 visa friendly. I already know you're looking for something that can offer fast time to market. There are many other qualities that I would love to learn uh, from you. And, uh, and the best way is to, uh, I'm gonna put a, an offer on the right hand side here, uh, to book a strategy session so we can start from uh, your uh, ideal business profile, the, your requirements, your level of comfort, there's no right or wrong. So I want to be able to uh, make you uh, invest the, the best use of your time, not poking around, but uh, explore opportunities that fit into this characteristic here. I call the sweet spot. So uh, we want you to invest your time exploring and learning from, uh, about franchise opportunities that real can get you approved, really can get you approved and can fit on your desired lifestyle. So focus for research. And of course, there is a secondary benefit here of doing this way. We create an increased quality of the match, which benefits you and the franchisor, right? We are essentially uh, trained by the franchisor zone who the ideal franchisee looks like. We are confronting that with what the ideal business profile looks like for you. And that's where the, the increased quality of the match come from. Uh, this, is a, this is kind of a heavy uh, slide that I want to build with you. Whenever I, I ask uh, an audience about uh, what's the first American franchise brand name that comes to, to, to their mind, I often hear uh, Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's, uh, Pizza Hut, and not fast food franchises. So essentially, there are three growth drivers out there. Marketing. Marketing is present in every single business you can think of. And all of those fast food franchises, they rely heavily on their location. So it's a combination of marketing and location. That's what most people recognize as a franchise business. There is a life beyond fast food. And there, are not, there is another growth driver called relationships. So businesses that rely on a combination of marketing and relationship, but mo more important than that, they do not rely on the location. And that's where the that acceleration is gonna come from. Uh, here on the left-hand side, you see kind of a scale regarding initial investment. Of course, businesses that, that rely on on a premium location to attract their, their potential customers, uh, they cost more. You have to invest part of that initial investment in remodeling, preparing that location to conform with the use uh, that is uh, determined by the franchisor, right? Uh, takes time and takes money. There is security deposit involved. Uh, your fixed operation uh, operating costs tend to be higher because you are paying a premium real estate to be in a, in a, in a visible high traffic location. Uh, you also are paying, uh, you know, employees to be there having customers or not during the 
commercial hours of, for example, a shopping center. On the left-hand side, you can operate those businesses out of a, an office space, and it's typically service-based business, mobile in nature. Your technicians, your employees, they drive to your customer's premises in order to perform the service or to apply a combination of product and service. So here is a is a is an idea where uh, each one of the 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 business categories would fit. Those are starting points, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity under $150,000 initial investment here. So if the the main driver for your search is time, time to market, I would strongly suggest you to consider the, the left side of this chart here. So we have a very simple uh, process. Uh, we start by defining a, an ideal business profile that will guide our search. We will bring it to your attention in your consideration a tailored franchise selection that have the qualities that you're looking for in the business. This all can be done within a couple of days, right? Because we do territory checks with each one of the franchisors that we, we are selecting for your consideration. We wanna make sure they have the territory available in the location, whenever, whatever in the United States you want to operate that business. And uh, there's no purpose to start learning about the business opportunity that is not available in, in your desired um, market. So this second part here, uh, item three to five, it takes anywhere from four to six weeks. What's the discovery process? The discovery process initiates with an introductory call that I will coordinate with the franchisors of, of your choice based on this franchise selection. And they, they have an, an educational process to transfer knowledge about their business model to you. So they will teach you diverse uh, uh, parts of the business, you know, how they market, how they sell, how they produce, how they operate, how they coordinate, how you manage the business, what uh, a day in the life of a franchisee looks like, and so on. I will be holding hands with you and provide coaching throughout this process, uh, preparing you for each new uh, meeting or webinar uh, with, with each one of the franchisors of your choice. We're gonna be comparing notes and making adjustments to the course as we go. So my objective is to bring you to step five here, an investment decision, go, no go. I want you to know what a good day in the life of a franchisee looks like. I want you to know what a bad day in the life of a franchisee looks like. And I want you to have a good understanding of what the financial, the financial uh, potential of the business is. That's how you do, uh, uh, you make an investment decision. Uh, another thing that I forgot to tell you, why does it take four to six weeks? Uh, probably one or two weeks out of those four to six weeks uh, is, a, is an optional but recommended step. We call this validation calls. In this process, you're gonna have access to every single franchisee of the system that you are investigating. You will be able to talk to people who are actually operating that business. And uh, that's very helpful for you because that all happens before you make an investment decision. So you can have not only the perspective of the franchisor, but also the franchisee. Uh, what happens after you make an investment decision? So um, when you make an investment decision, two things happen, right? So uh, immigration attorney Bobby Chung will start working on your application. There is uh, a step for creating a business plan in the format that the, the immigration wants to review it. Um, and uh, you have to gather some, some of your personal uh, documentation to be part of the, the application process. And in parallel to that, you need to start preparing in your, your, your business. So if you are investing in a new business that require uh, renting an office space, go out and rent an office space. If it requires to buy uh, a service vehicle, equipment, or a small inventory, go out and do that. 
if uh, you can use that time to be trained by the franchise. The idea is for you to bring this new business up to be substantially complete to initiate operations. That's the point where Attorney Chang will, will have enough evidences that the, the funds are committed and uh, he will apply for your E2 visa. Uh, my process is free for the investor. I work with 530 plus franchisors. They pay my bill. Uh, there's no obligation to invest in anything that we suggest for you, for your consideration. No pressure. Take the time that you think is, uh, is, uh, is appropriate for you and no hype. We're not going to inflate anything that uh, just to create a, you know, value where there's, there's none. So we're going to cut to the, to the chase here and help you find uh, the right business for your particular goals. Uh, I'd like to open for q and I'll leave this slide up with my contact information and Bobby Chang's contact information as well. Uh, Bobby, back to you. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was awesome. Extremely informative. And I'm always impressed with your depth of knowledge. Thank you very much. All right. All right. So we have a few comments here. Um, all right. So I believe Stephanie's broadcasting this. Okay. Uh, Viraj asks, I'm on TN visa working in hotel IT is expiring to 2022, but I am on a furlough from, uh, from my work and I can study in the USA in computer based program course. So um, I I don't understand what what's the the question. So I, I believe the question is can he study? Yeah, I think I I understand Viraj's question. Um, so you know, T, Viraj is on a working visa, the TN working visa uh, in the hotel business, and uh, it's good till twenty twenty two. He's currently furloughed, and w was wondering if he can uh, engage in computer uh, courses. Um, the general answer is yes. Um, working visas, as long as you're maintaining your working visa, working for the employer for the requisite number of hours as required by your TN or otherwise working visa, you can engage in part-time study on the side. That's okay. Okay. Um, then the condition is that you are maintaining your employment visa status. Now, the fact that you've been furloughed, um, that, that, that's the part that makes it kind of tricky. So furlough means that you're temporarily off of work uh, because the business, the employer is closed uh, understandably. And uh, you know the condition I mentioned earlier that would allow you to maintain status and allow you to study part-time on the side is condition on you maintaining your employment. So uh, furlough, if the furlough means that you're going to get your job back and you're going to resume employment as soon as the hotel is able to begin operating um, and your, your, your job is secure, then, then you're fine. Uh, but if a furlough means that you might actually lose that job, then you got to be careful because if you lose the job, then um you'd be considered out of status and of course you wouldn't be able to out of study and you have to you know get ready to pack up and leave after the grace period is over or you pursue the strategies that um, i had um explained earlier switching to a b1 business visitor status or student visa status or something else okay so it's very very particular to to his condition and how this furlough has been properly documented as well right that's uh, right yeah, in it, terms you would have to look into that, uh, you know, with more details in order to to this, be um, advice. This situation actually applies to a lot of people because just mm -hmm. there's been unprecedented amount of furloughing and layoffs. So a lot of people are in a, a furlough situation, and the the challenge with furlough is that you're you're not working, but uh, but you're not laid off. So you're kind of like in this purgatory area, and uh, it's kind of a unique times that we're in that's creating this unique challenge great we have another great question here from juan lemus how long does it take for the e2 visa 
since the application to approval? I love this question. Everybody asks this question. And it's a favorite <laughs> question. So, uh, uh, Juan, thank you for the question. Um, you're gonna, everybody's going to benefit from this. So the E2 visa process, uh, the whole process is broken up into two stages. And the first stage is making that qualifying investment. And that could get, take several months. Typically, in my experience, somewhere between two and six months for most people. Some people will take more time. As you can imagine, there are variables. Some people just take a long time to decide on the business. And some people take some time to raise the money or some people take a, a bit of time to set up the business. So that the first stage of making a qualifying investment varies, depends on unique personal situation. The second stage is applying for the E2 visa with the US government. Now, typically E2 visa are mostly applied for with the US embassy in your home country. And in most cases, E2 visas are uh, issued or decision is made within one to three months period of time, depending on how busy the U.S. Embassy is at the moment you apply. Now, we're in kind of an unusual situation right now where um, at the present moment, all U.S. Embassies worldwide have their visa services temporarily suspended because of fears of a uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, so right now uh even we're allowed to submit the applications all the u.s embassies are not making visa decision at the present time and when they finally open and i'm praying that it's going to happen sometime during the summer uh there's going to be a backlog of cases where they need to uh, work through and then um uh, before they get back to their normal pace so i'm, I'm imagining in the coming months they're probably going to take a longer time than usual to adjudicate make decisions on e2 visas but once things get back to normal, it's typically arranged between one to three months. And that's if you're applying with the U.S. Embassy in your home country. For folks that are already here in the valid visa status, you have the option of applying for change of visa with the U.S. CIS, U.S. Immigration Service. And there you have the option of applying uh, into two options, two uh, processing options. One is a regular processing, which U.S. CIS typically take between two and four months to make a decision. Um, second option is called premium service. Uh, it's an expedited service. If you pay immigration an extra fee of $1,440, uh, they could give you a response within 15 days. The trick here is the guarantee of 15 days is that you'll get a response from U.S. immigration. Okay, uh, you either get a res that response will either be a decision or a request for additional evidence um, that gets lost in translation for a lot of people. It's not a guaranteed decision within that 15 days uh, under expedited processing. It's a guarantee of just getting a response. Okay. Hopefully Great. that answered your question. Thank you. Uh, to the audience, if you have any other questions, please uh, type of questions about, you know, visa application or, or about franchising. Uh, let me just wait a couple of minutes here. And if we don't have any new questions, we can uh, wrap it up. All right, Bobby, I think there are no additional questions. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity today. And uh, you and I, we have collaborated in, in multiple cases in the past. And I feel confident that, you know, if someone is considering the E2 visa route, uh, we can we can assist them in, uh, in, in a way that everything can be uh, resolved within that six months period. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Really enjoy uh, presenting this webinar. Always an honor, Daniel. And I look forward to working with uh, all of you, as well as Daniel in the future. Thank you so much. Um, we have a hold on. I have a last minute question. Oh, uh, hold on. I'm typing the question. Cool. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna, <laughs> we're going to hold on. We're going to hold on. Yeah, so, so far. Excuse me. Take your time so far. So uh, Viraj is asking uh, uh, about, you know, 25,000 um, investment, right? That that tends to be very low on the, uh, you know, when it recommended it's, it's around $100,000. You, you, you have done something around 35 in the past. Uh, let me just bring something up here that may create other opportunities. For example, uh, you may have 
a business partner that can also uh, contribute for the initial investment. Uh, so that's a possibility that you shouldn't disregard at this time. Great, great. So, All right, uh, we have uh, Zafar. Yes, if you are in B1, B2, you can, can you apply for changing status? And the uh, second part of the question is no need to leave US and go back to your home country, uh, country of residence and apply there. Is that mandatory? So, so two parts of the question. Uh, first part is can you change your status? If you are in B1, B2, can you apply to change your status? And the second is, do you need to go back to your home country in order to do this? So, great question. Um, so the simple answer is yes, it is possible to apply for change of status to E2 investor uh, directly here in the United States without leaving the country and applying directly with the USCIS. That's definitely a possibility. There are nuances to that. However, uh, if you're here as a tourist and um, your authorized activity is only leisure and vacation, uh, it could get a little tricky. Suddenly you make an investment, apply for change of status. Immigration may have a problem with that. If you came in as a business visitor, then absolutely investment is totally in line, consistent with uh, a business visitor and changing the status shouldn't be an issue for a uh, business visitor. So you got to be mindful of whether you were granted entry as a tourist or as a business visitor. Um, once you get the E2 approval uh, through change of status here in the United States, um, keep in mind that is only an approval that allows you to stay here while you stay here. It, the, the change of status to E2 approval, uh, it does not provide any uh, travel authorization. So what that means is if you were to depart to the United States, the, that change of status approval does get canceled and you'd have to reapply for the E2 visa with the U.S. Embassy in your home country before you can come back to the U.S., uh, which is why most of my clients will apply and obtain their E2 visa directly from the U.S. Embassy because that's where you have the best chance of getting a multiple entry E2 visa. That's what most people want to have the freedom of travel and a potentially longer visa. Um, but for folks that are, um, you know, don't really need to travel and have a uh, concerns about going back to their home country, then the changing status could be a very viable option. It just, you gotta be mindful that the approval is limited and it's just a permission to stay here while you stay here, okay? Hopefully so, that answers your question. Bobby, uh, on that same note, you can prepare the entire application from here, uh, even apply from here to their their embassy in their home country, right? Uh, yeah. Is that yeah. How it works? If they're, the, the way to applying the embassy in home country, typically, obviously, as an attorney, I would prepare the application, have the client sign all the documentation, and I submit it for you to the U.S. embassy in your home country. And as long as you have proper visa status, you can stay in the U.S to wait for the embassy's uh, visa appointment. So you can stay here on the B1, B2 visa, you can stay here on your current employment visa, student visa, you can wait here. And then once the embassy has reviewed all those documentation for your business investment, the E2 application, they will then allow you to schedule an interview. Typically it's like an online calendar, you log into account, you pick the date you want in an online calendar. They give you that flexibility so you can decide when you wanna travel to your home country. And then you will only travel to your home country to attend that visa appointment. And then after you pass the interview, typically they'll issue that visa within a week after. Perfect, perfect. That, that, that's a, a great clarification because you can spend the minimum time possible outside the United States and come back here. So you don't have to demobilize. Maybe you have a rental apartment or some, some other arrangements here. Uh, you don't need to demobilize everything. You're gonna stay in the minimum amount of time possible outside the country just to satisfy the visa uh, review process and come back to the United States once the two visa is, is, is granted. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much again for, for the opportunity. We are reaching our time limits here. And um, I hope to, to work with all of you, uh, work with you as well, Bobby, and, uh, and help these folks find a, a way to, to stay legally here in the United States. And the two visa is a great uh, route. Absolutely. It is our mission to help folks do that. Thank you so much, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful weekend, wonderful night. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.